Uh, thank you. And uh, I want to um, introduce the audience to Chiara Russo, as I said, uh, University of Antwerp, working in uh, in uh, the sort of the the last of the of these work packages that are investigating the conditions for robustness in crisis governance. Chiara is has looked into uh, th those. These are kinds of different aspects of the cases that we look on, right? These are very much some of the themes that are uh, up here are, you know, misinformation, disinformation, all that, but also trust between different uh, modes of governance, uh, uh, modes of knowledge and trust between the knowledges of different parts of the population and so on. So this is a very crucial area, we believe, for, for robustness and crisis governance. And we look very much forward to your presentation, Chiara, uh, let me give you the floor. Yeah, that's great. Uh, so already my colleagues before uh, mentioned you need expert-based policy making and you need consulting with experts and where political knowledge comes in. Uh, so my presentation will deal with all of that. Uh, so I'm glad that some bits already came uh, from your questions, but also from the presentations of my colleagues. So I will share uh, my screen. Yes, I think you can see it and you can still hear me well. So that's great. Um, yeah, so as Rasmus was saying, I'm a researcher at the University of Antwerp and I've been working on societal intelligence and this deals with knowledge. Um, so how knowledge is exchanged during the crisis and what do you do with it? Um, so, uh, so how did we start uh, our research? Uh, so, of course, uh, the first thing that comes to mind when we talk about crisis management and crisis governance is that we need the experts. We need to rely on some experts uh, because, of course, if we think about the example of COVID, um, there is a lot of uncertainty and we don't really have the information to come up with solutions. Uh, so this was definitely a big point. And uh, I'm not going to be here to say, oh, no, that was wrong. <laughs> Definitely not. Um, so this was the first instinct uh, that a lot of uh, public leaders had. Um, and what we noticed, however, um, both from the literature, but also from the experiences, uh, from the interviews in our data collection, uh, is that there seemed to be quite a distance between the central level and the local level. Uh, and between the measures that were taken and the experiences of people. Uh, so, for example, I was interviewing someone and they were telling me, oh, well, but like, how can blind people know if they are two meters away from someone else? Or like, how can they cross the road without the help of someone who is closer to them than two meters? Uh, so that was quite indeed, like, seemed obvious to me when they told me, but I hadn't thought about this before. Um, so this also means that there was the risk of um taking up solutions that were kind of overlooking some civil society's concerns um so starting from this um we thought okay this means that certain knowledge is feeding into solutions um and we want to know which which one so which knowledge makes the cut um and how was this knowledge exchanged how was it used then for policy making so this is what we wanted to investigate and if I want to go deeper a bit into our research question, that's so the question that guided our research, uh, we wanted to know how these knowledges were interacting, how they were exchanged, and how these interactions would contribute to the robust governance of the crisis, which is also what you've heard until now also from my colleagues. Um, so our assumption here is that um, if you have a wider knowledge base, if you have these knowledge exchanges and interactions, if people exchange information with each other and make sense of it together, you would develop a certain intelligence that then would be the base for the robust governance of the crisis. Um, and we want to look into how this intelligence came, comes about um, and who is there to bring the knowledge to the table and how it is used. Um, so we also assume that there is different types of knowledge, and I think this is not surprising to any of you. Uh, so you might have called uh, when you needed some experts, and this might have been from different disciplines. So expert knowledge has also diversity within its own field. Uh, so you can have experts from med the medical uh, discipline, but also social sciences like I am. Uh, and at the same time, within political knowledge, you have people that are super expert about um for example, institutions like 
EU institutions or uh, legislative processes at the national level or some other, um, as you can see here, some examples. Um, the third type of knowledge that we consider is what we call life word knowledge, which, which is the knowledge of citizens. Um, so for example, some people like, well, actually everyone <laughs> brings their experiences to the table, uh, but some may be more into uh, the spiritual or religious uh, knowledge. Um, for example, um, when Stephen was discussing the case in the Netherlands of this community, um, it was important for someone to know what their values were about. And this is, they needed life word knowledge about the spiritual side of this. Um, so these different types of knowledge can be brought about by different actors to the table. So we also consider these variations. Um, as Rasmus was introducing this, he talked about interfaces. Um, you can think of this as like arenas or places where people exchange the knowledge. Um, so this is how we have conceptualized this. As you can see in this triangle, um, we can witness during the crisis for example, expert and political knowledge meeting in a certain interface. This can be a committee or um, like a certain ex expert group that is consulting uh, with the government or something like that, uh, or the political knowledge meeting with the life word knowledge. If, for example, um, political actors um, are consulting with, um, for example, in the case of schools, we can think of of teachers or uh, parents associations or students associations. Uh, an expert and life word knowledge would be, as an example, I will also bring it forward later, um, but if we think of those TV talk shows where the experts were there and invited and they were uh, taking questions from the people from the audience, that is an example of an interface where the expert knowledge could meet with the experiences of people. So this is what I studied in practice. Um, and I'm going to present you now some pre preliminary results, which I hope we can comment on together. Um, as already said by my colleagues, um, I uh, draw these results from nine EU countries, which are part of the project. Um, and um, I, of course, studied the Belgian. Uh, I was in Belgian team, so studied Belgian, but all my colleagues contributed to this data collection. Um, so uh, to study these interfaces, um, we came up with some um, conditions for them to, for this knowledge exchange to take place and to happen and to be successful. And one of these is inclusivity. So within these groups, was there inclusion, was where different types of knowledge included and was this successful? Uh, we have some successful cases that you can see on the slide. Um, and these are cases where, for example, both uh, public and private actors were included or a political and expert knowledge were meeting um, or at the local level, in the example of, of uh, Czech Republic, um, that not only the majors, but also the um, the uh, administration from the hospital and the public administration for the municipality uh, were meeting to discuss emergency scenarios. So inclusivity is definitely one of the conditions that we need to have that knowledge exchange and to develop that intelligence. Um, another condition needed is productive contestation. So with this, we mean where people are allowed to bring to the table different opinions and different views. Um, and uh, was this productive? Like, did this allow to make sense of the crisis better? Um, and actually what we saw um, was that in the national media, as I was mentioning before, there were a lot of uh, TV shows, but actually this ended up not really being productive. So it was contestation, definitely, um, but it didn't really lead to produce intelligence for the crisis. It was just people defending their choices and defending their knowledge. Um, and a lot of uh, blame, shaming, uh, so not really productive, so not really what we mean by building intelligence. Um, then, of course, there is the extreme case of Hungary, where we have a suppression of alternative uh, opinions, so with the law for combating COVID and really restricting uh, the spread of misinformation, but that, of, of course, also included alternative opinions. Um, however, I also want to bring to the table a positive case, which is the uh, a YouTube television show in the Netherlands, and this is the same community that Steven was talking about. Uh, and what they did was a YouTube television show that you can see here. Um, and 
Uh, this is the description. Uh, it's in Dutch, but uh, what they say here is like, please participate. It was a live uh, YouTube uh, show, so they could ask the questions. And what happened? Like what they say here is like, please um, ask your questions, and experts will answer you. But what they mean by experts is not only like the medical experts, as we instinctively think about, but also the what they say, and it's very interesting. It, they say experience experts. Uh, so that's exactly what I mean with life word knowledge. And in this case, um, even if the religious leaders were bringing forward alternative opinions, which uh, might have not been in line with the medical experts, this was really still done in a very respectful manner and um, allowing people to ask questions and to make sense together and also making them able to make decisions, to make informed decisions. Um, so this was definitely a positive case of productive contestation. Um, another issue that we it's uh, important when trying to build intelligence is self-efficacy. So when talking to people that took play that took part in interfaces, so they were bringing their knowledge to the table, it seemed clear that um, being able to bring change. So knowing that by sharing your knowledge, you might have an impact on policy making was really key. Um, so of course, with the expert groups that you can see examples from Denmark, Estonia, and the Netherlands, all these expert groups were really impactful on the pol policy making. So for example, the team in the Netherlands um, recommended to the government not to have um, not to have uh, people wearing masks in the beginning of the of the pandemic and indeed the government listened to them and they said yeah like we're not going to let them wear it because our management team said it's not maybe this is not the way to go um so they were really indeed having an, an impact on on um, on the policy um, and the same happened with a broader consultation group in Belgium uh, when it came to school closures. Um, this was quite a broad consultation group and people really felt that their voice was heard, that they were like affecting uh, policy change and that what they were sharing then had an impact on the recommendations, but even the measures that were taken afterwards. Um, so if you invite people to the table, they also want to know that what they're saying is going to be of some use. Uh, so that's also important. And um, also intensity. So how often are you actually meeting? Um, sometimes you ask someone for advice, you see them once, and then this really doesn't allow for that feedback loops that you would wish for to build intelligence and to build a robust solution. Um, so in the case of, of school closure, a lot of uh, consultation groups that were quite wide um, in, in variety of actors involved uh, met quite frequently. Um, and this really allowed to for the actors to give um, continuous feedback on the measures and also to then adapt the measures based on this feedback. Um, so this aspect of learning how you're doing because you meet again with the same people is also really important. Um, and another case that I want to bring to you today is that um, is that one of the universities in Hungary that really intensified efforts to um, engage with civil society um, and to discuss um, the different aspects of the crisis. So from pre-crisis, um, there was definitely a change in the intensity with which, so in how often um, they engage with civil society. Um, and finally, um, we have adaptability. Um, and this means like changing, it can be a change and an adaptation in both like the actor composition of this group of this interface that is meeting to exchange knowledge or changes in, in goals, changes in, in how formal or informal it is. Um, and the examples here, the first one is about actor composition. And you can see that different countries were, um, were doing this. Um, so for example, in uh, the Netherlands, um, the groups working on school closures, so trying to decide um, yeah, when schools would close and so on, uh, actually invited ad hoc actors when it was needed. So when they had to discuss um, 
digital teaching, uh, so online teaching, they invited banks to see how they could provide laptops and how they could finance this. Uh, or in Estonia, um, in the um, health boards meeting with the municipalities, uh, the different school directors were invited when there was an outbreak in their city or when it was uh, indeed relevant for them to join that conversation. Um, and another example of this is a change in the in what you produce, uh, for example, in terms of communication, what we call boundary objects. Um, so uh, different uh, states were uh, trying to really reach some hard to reach groups. Um, so for example, marginalized communities, but also people that speak different languages. And in all of these countries, so Belgium, Spain, and Denmark, um, which also have some of them have uh, a lot of um, different migrants communities. Um, you can see a change in the production of different uh, leaflets or um, intermediaries trying to reach uh, different groups in different languages. So an adaptation in the way you communicate what you decide or um, the objects that you're producing by this knowledge exchange. Um, so to conclude, I wanna show you what I am taking out of all of this, but of course we can discuss it together. So it seems that there are some pathways leading to society to build the built of societal intelligence and of robust solutions. Um, as you can see from the color coding, <laughs> uh, inclusivity is definitely um, is definitely very crucial. So including different types of knowledge, which are brought forward by different actors, uh, seems to be quite key. But at the same time, adaptability also um, comes up a lot. So you might have inclusivity, you might have a lot of people bringing different knowledge, but if you're not continuously meeting with them to learn and to, or if you're not adapting your goals as the crisis goes by, it might not be enough. Um, so you can see these are definitely like different pathways in different um, combinations of conditions that seems seem to have worked during COVID. Of course, I want to keep going on this research and having more like precise results on this, but it seems that there are different combinations um, that allow to build intelligence and then allow to have robust uh, crisis uh, governance. Um, so you can have self-efficacy, so people thinking, oh, I will really affect the change if I share my knowledge. And then if you adapt to the stages of a crisis or if you're meeting more intensely, it both seems like as a um, successful solution for building intelligence and robustness. Um, so I hope that next time I will be sharing my uh, findings, I will have more precise um, indications of this, but I think this is already a great uh, way to start our conversation and uh, see whether you recognize any of this. But given the diversity within European countries, um, it's also really, um, in a way comforting to see that there is different ways to reach our goals because of course political culture and the way we see institutions and the way we see knowledge is definitely very different um so the the thing that there is different pathways i find very very positive um yeah so uh, final slide what have we learned uh from all of this it seems that indeed the inclusive co-production and the adaptive learning, so making sure you're adapting and you're learning within the crisis, um, seem to be key to innovative responses and better outcomes. What we also want to underline is that having these conditions and having these knowledge exchanges in this way reduces the risk of adopting uh, governance solutions that really overlook fundamental societal concerns. Um, and uh, expanding the knowledge base in different ways um, really also expands our understanding of the crisis and what needs to be done. Um, yeah, so I think I will leave it to this uh, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you so much.